So chapter one is introduction to public procurement. Introduction to public procurement. So public procurement is a very critical area in all organization. <clears throat> Mostly when you're talking about public procurement, what comes into our mind is the public entities. And the public entities here, we are talking about the ministries, we are talking about departments of government, and we are also talking about agencies of government. Ministries here, we are saying, for example, we can talk about the Ministry of Health, we can talk about the Ministry of Transport. And when you are talking about departments, we can also talk about the, the Department of Defense, Department of in, uh, Immigration, and what have you. When we are talking about agencies, we are talking about, uh, for example, KEMSA is an agent. We can talk about other agents or authorities. And authorities here, we can look at authorities like KRA and others. And when you're also talking about public entities, you're also talking about um, the government in terms of uh, public schools. We're talking about universities. We are talking, we are talking about hospitals that are owned by the government fully and others. We're also talking about commissions that have been established by an act of parliament. For example, the IEBC, we are talking about other commissions like the Teacher Service Commission, Commission for Revenue Allocation, and what have you. So all those form part of public entities. So when you're talking about public procurement, you need to look at procurement in those institutions and what happens during procurement. So procurement is an activity or function that involves the acquisition by purchase, rental, lease, hire purchase, license, tenancy, franchise, or by any other contractual means of any type of works, asset services, or goods to meet an identified need. <clears throat> so now when you're talking about procurement, there are some things that need to come to your mind. So procurement can take different forms. For example, you can acquire goods by purchase. Maybe you buy by uh, the process, the normal process of procurement, or you can rent an asset. And rental is normally shorter compared to lease. Lease normally takes a very long time. Rental and lease can be more or less the same, but the only difference is that rental normally takes a shorter period of time. You can decide to pay rent maybe after every month or maybe after every two months. But lease, you can lease a property even for 10, 15 years. And lease is normally a longer time. Then you have higher purchase. You can also decide to procure using installments where you pay the first installment then you pay other installments depending on your agreement with the supplier. Then also we have license and tenancy where you enter into an agreement with a certain institution so that you can become a tenant for a certain period of time. We also talk about franchise. Franchise is where you use somebody's name to do business. And at the end of it all, you pay what is called royalty or any other contractual means to acquire asset services works. And that purpose of acquiring all this is to ensure that you are able to meet an identified need. So once you understand what is procurement, what is then public procurement? Public procurement is the acquisition of systems, goods, services, or works at the best possible total cost of ownership in the right quantity, right time, and in the right place for the direct benefit or use of the government. So here we are talking about acquiring system goods, services, or works at the best possible total cost of ownership. So the main focus of public procurement is to be able to get value for your money. And that is why we are talking about the total cost of ownership. So you need to own that, that cost 
And that is why before you buy something, you need to do what is called due diligence, or you need also to do what is called market survey, so that you get the, the best value for what you're buying. The acquisition can be from third parties or from in-house providers. So you can decide to buy from another firm. And when you buy from another firm, we are saying that you are buying from a third party. But if you decide to buy in-house, maybe a larger organization deciding to buy within that organization, then you can say that it's in-house purchase because the people who are providing this service or goods are your colleagues or another, another institution that is a subsidiary or is a branch of this particular institution. Then uh, so we are saying you can either buy in-house or through a third party. But the main focus of procurement process is to ensure that at all given time, you are getting value for what you are buying or value for what you are procuring. So the other thing we are going to talk about is the objective of public procurement. What do you need to achieve in public procurement at the end of the day? So public procurement intends to achieve the following. Number one is to maximize efficiency. And efficiency normally allows you to be effective in what you're doing. And that is why when you go to different government institution, you realize that procurement has enabled efficiency in the operation by ensuring you get what you require whenever you require it. The other objective of public procurement is to promote fair competition. Fair competition by giving each bidder a chance to be part of a particular procurement or particular bid by using what is called open tendering, which gives a different bidders an opportunity to participate. The other objective of public procurement is to promote integrity. And integrity here is doing things right, always. Therefore, when public procurement is implemented successfully, the main focus is to promote integrity. The other objective is to ensure that at the end of the day, just a minute, no. So the other objective of public procurement is to increase transparency and accountability and also promote local industry. So when you are talking about transparency, we are talking about transparency in the procurement process. So procurement process should not be biased. We need to understand what normally happens. And that is why at different stages of the procurement process, different people are involved for purposes of ensuring that process is transparent. And the issue of accountability here, we are saying somebody must be responsible for the goods. Somebody must be responsible for his or her action. And that is why we have the issue of accountability. Then the other objective is to optimize cost by lowering transactional cost and overhead cost. One of the key objective of public procurement is the issue of cost. And that is why they normally focus more on uh, cost, 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 value for money. The other objective is to utilize asset by outsourcing and inventory management. So you will be able to create or to utilize uh, assets through outsourcing. And outsourcing here, we are talking about outsourcing non-core activities and also ensuring that at the end of the day, you are able to manage your inventory so that you do not have an oversupply or an undersupply of a particular item. 
The other thing is to create value through process products, development and quality improvement. Here we are talking about value of process and value of product. And that is why the government is emphasizing a lot on the process to ensure that you get quality. And quality, remember, is fitness for, for purpose. We have another objective, which is to facilitate the promotion of local industry and economic development and economic development. The other thing we are going to talk about today is the evolution of public procurement in Kenya. When you are talking about evolution, we are talking about the stages that public procurement has undergone over the years. And remember, when you talk about uh, the public procurement, we can trace the process of public procurement way from 1947. And during that time, we call it the era of the colonial period or pre-colonial period. And this was between 1947 and 1962. The second stage was the post-colonial period, and this was between 1963 and 1989. And this is when now Kenya got it, it, it independent and started doing procurement. Then we have another era, which is the World Bank period, which was between 1990 and 2000. And we have the public procurement reform period which was between 2001 and 2009. And at this stage, we find that we had a lot of transformation. And this is the period when we introduced even the, the Public Procurement Asset Disposal Act. Then the last uh, uh, stage or phase was the era of the new constitution, which started in 2010 up to today. So let us look at them in detail. So the colonial period, basically we are saying that procurement was established under the Ministry of Works, which basically dealt with more acquisition and supply of goods, works or services. Then uh, in 1960, we also looked at uh, the procurement branch that was established. And the work of the procurement branch was to be able to acquire goods for common use, for ministries, departments, and public bodies. Later, they established what was called the Central Tendering Board, which was also responsible for acquiring and awarding of, of tender. It was also doing what is called market research for the government. The second phase was between 1963 and 1989. And at this stage, which started in 1963, procurement was centralized under the Ministry of, of Works and it was headed by somebody referred to as the chief procurement officer. And we also had the chief storekeeper. And the work of this chief storekeeper was to ensure that they controlled all common user items in government. What do we mean by common user items? These are items that are used across the board by various institutions. For example, you can look at a product like photocopying papers. Photocopying paper is an example of a common user item. So the work of the storekeeper was to control these items. So in 1970, we had what is called the British Farm Crown Agent. And the work of the British Crown Agent was to uh, do procurement for international purchases. And their work was to ensure that local suppliers were able to bring the best for external supplies internationally. In 1978, 
the supply manual was developed. And the work of supply manual was to ensure that it gave details on what was supposed to be done at every stage of procurement. And this manual was created by the Office of Director of Government Supply Services. And the work of the director was to ensure that they provide observance and ensure that the manual was up and, and running. Then also we had the Minister of Finance, which was given the overall responsibility of regulating public procurement. And that happens up to date because the Minister of Finance is also responsible for what happens in most procurement. Even when they are hiring, they normally consider hiring through the Ministry of Finance. So we had some issues during that time. And one of the issues that was uh, identified was that we had issues of lack of accountability. People are not accountable for their actions. There are also issues of vague procurement procedures and policies. So people could come up with their own procedures for purposes of individual gains or sometimes issues of conflict of interest, which affected the whole process of procurement. Then we also had issues of corruption that were very common. And corruption here, we are looking at public officers trying to collude with suppliers for purposes of defrauding the company or defrauding the institutions that they were given responsibility to manage. Then the other issue that was also recognized during this period was the issue of lack of structure. There was no clear structure in that you didn't understand who was supposed to report to who, and this affected the whole procurement process, making it to become very, very slow. Then issues of transparency were also identified during that time. And when we talk about corruption, we cannot fail to talk about lack of transparency in the system. Then issues of lack of dispute resolution mechanism were also identified. In terms of when a supplier had grievances, there were no avenues for the supplier to share those grievances, therefore leading to a very dissatisfied supplier or bidder. Then the issue of poor planning also was identified. And you could find that sometimes even contracts were not done well. The issues of failure to check on the existing inventory, which affected the whole process of implementing projects and monitoring them. Then the other thing was the lack of checks and balances. And this was a very great loophole because we had issues of inferior products or goods which entered the market because of uh, these imbalances that really affected the procurement process. So in 1982, the government issued a district focus for rural development strategy. And uh, in 1983, there are also some changes in the central tender in the board. The first three was the World Bank period, which was between 1991 and 2000. And during this time, the World Bank did a survey or a research that was deemed necessary. And when they did this, uh, uh, this uh, research, they realized that we really needed to get some reforms in public procurement. And one of the recommendations that were in those reports, or one or some of the findings that were in this report included the issues of inefficiency in management of public funds. So there were some issues when it came to management of public funds. Management of public. 
Then the other thing that was also very critical during this time was the issue of the government's inability to provide service efficiently. And this really affected the whole process of procurement of these services. Then uh, we had issues of lack of solid and transparent legal framework. So we did not have rules and regulations that guided people in procurement. Then the issue of lack of fair competition, which makes it an, an, an abuse. So we had issues of um, abuse when it came to participation of various bidders within public procurement. Phase four was between was between 2001 to 2009. And during this time, we had the exchequer and audit regulation. And the work of the exchequer was basically to look at the processes in terms of how the public entities were using finances. And this led to the office of the auditor general that was given this mandate. Then the other thing was the law on public procurement and disposal was also established during this time. And this law led to the 2005 Public Procurement Disposal Act implementation. And later, after one year, they also introduced the Public Procurement Disposal Regulation. In 2007, they also established the supplier practitioners, uh, the supplier practitioners act of 2007. Then later in 2009, they established the public private partnership act for purposes of trying to balance the public sector and the private sector. And the main focus was to ensure that successful implementation of PPPs was going to assist in promoting investment and creation of value for, for money. Then the other thing was the issue of risk transfer. Risk transfer. Phase five was the era of the new constitution, which was promulgated in 2010. And the constitution came up with various issues for example, it came up with Article 227 that also led to the inclusion of preference and reservation schemes that also led to the issues of county government regulations, circulars and water view. Then we also had the Public Procurement and Asset Disposal Act, which was reviewed in 2015. And the regulation also was reviewed in 2016. In 2020 also, we had a new revised regulation up to date. So we had some reforms that were addressed. We had some reforms that were addressed so a World Bank sponsored study was launched in 1997. And the review identified the following weaknesses in the procurement process. So what led to the reforms were the reasons that were in the review. And one of the reasons that the World Bank said was the reduced effectiveness of public financial management. And this also led to the introduction of the Public Finance Management Act of 2009 because of the recommendation on the weakness that was identified by the World Bank. Then the government's inability to deliver services efficiently. So there were some concerns. Why is the government not delivering better services? And one of the reasons was the issues of process or the rules that were obscure. Then the issue of transparent legal framework was not clear enough. 
Therefore, it led to weaknesses in the public procurement sector. Then uh, issues of fair competition also are not identified in procurement. And this led to fairly serious abuses where people took advantage of the process and did not. Then based uh, on the findings, these were some of uh, the recommendations. So they wanted So the initial result of the reforms was public procurement regulations that were issued in 2001 under the existing Exchequer and Audit Act. Just a minute. So they say that these regulations unified all the circulars that govern the public procurement system. Therefore, they abolished the central tender tender board and introduced the, the other, um, the exchequer and the, the, and, the, and, and the audit. Then they established the public procurement directorate uh, was also abolished. Then uh, the regulation applied to all public entities. Those ones are, you can read, that is just history. The other problems that were identified is the issues of uh, variations of a pricing, lack of structured authorization of expenditure levels, issues of poor procurement record and documentation. Then we also had issues of uncontrolled low value procurement of, of items, lack of legal performance were also identified. Any question? No. So let's look at the principles guiding public procurement. Once you understand the evolution, then it is always important to understand what are some of the principles that will guide public procurement in, in Kenya. So basically we are saying Principles are foundations under which procurement operates. For example, if you want to do something, you need to have a certain principle that will guide you to do that thing. Failure to have principles, then we say, principles are like pillars that will support what you want to do at the end of the day. So in public procurement also, we have principles that guide us. So the principle acts as a framework of the code of conduct in public procurement. And practitioners are supposed to understand some of these principles or the code of conduct that they are supposed to embrace. Failure to do this, it might lead to disciplinary action or it might lead to even your practitioner's license might be revoked or you can also be deregistered if you don't follow some of these principles in public procurement. To meet the public procurement objective, these principles guide good public procurement. So these are the principles that will help you as a public procurement practitioner to be able to work effectively without any fear of maybe discriminations or fear of losing a job. So what are some of these principles? What are some of these principles? So the first principle is the national value and principle of governance. National value and principle of governance. So public procurement puts into consideration national values. And when you're talking about national values, we are talking about equity in distribution of opportunities. Every citizen of Kenya has an equal opportunity to be part and parcel of public procurement. 
Then the other issue is inclusiveness in decision making. And that is why when you look at the government, when they want to do something, they must include even the citizens. And that is why we have public participation. And recently we are talking about the house lady. And yesterday when uh, we were watching news, we realized that most media houses were talking about the finance bill. So that is part of decision making where the citizens of a country are given an opportunity to air their views before any decision can be made. Then the issue of uh, inclusiveness, also we are looking at the marginalized in society. And the marginalized here, we are looking at people who are disadvantaged in one way or another. For example, when you look at uh, the disabled or people living with disability, or even the women and the youth, or other people who are in areas that are marginalized, we also need to consider those people during public procurement because they form part of the national values. Then the other issue is good governance. And we normally say good governance starts with the leadership of the country. So you need to choose leaders who are considerate and when they are making decisions, they need to consider the impact of the decisions that they are going to make, whether these decisions are going to be decisions that will make or break the country. Then the issue also of integrity and transparency are very, very critical. And also we are talking about accountability and sustainable development. Sustainability is very critical. And that nowadays, the government is focusing more on sustainable development, trying to figure out the best way to recycle what we have, reuse the resources that we have, so that we do not deplete the natural resources. So it is always important that you share all this information with the stakeholders. And stakeholders here, we are talking about the public, the suppliers, and the supply chain partners. All this information must be shared so that people are aware of what is happening. For example, if today you want to locate the finance bill, you will be able to just go to the internet and you can Google the finance bill and everything will pop up on the screen so that you read and understand it before making any comments. Procurement should be open for all individuals and companies to bid. If there is selective or restricted bidding, it should be only for those firms that meet certain minimum qualifications. And that is why when you look at the government, they normally say, Open tendering is the most preferred procurement method. The other methods are just alternative procurement methods, but open tendering is recommended. Why open tendering? Because it gives every person an opportunity to be part and parcel of that. Then you have equality and freedom from discrimination is another principle. Freedom from discrimination. And when you are talking about discrimination, we are talking about many things that can lead to discrimination. Maybe discrimination in terms of gender, discrimination in terms of race, discrimination in terms of marital, mar marital status, in terms of health, all those are discrimination. And one of the focus of government is to ensure that we do not have this discrimination or discrimination in terms of health status, culture, or some beliefs. And that is why when you look at the act or when you look at the constitution chapter, I think the Bill of Rights, 
it talks about the equality and freedom that needs to be taken into consideration. Another principle is the principle of affirmative action. And this is chapter article 55 and 55, 56 of the constitution, which talks about affirmative action. And when you're talking about affirmative action, we are looking at these categories of people who form part of this affirmative action. And one of the categories is the youth. And here, when you're talking about the youth, the youth is between the age of 18 to 35 years. You must be given an opportunity of procuring or be, be part of a certain bid. We're also talking about the minorities and the marginalized groups. And minority here, we are looking at the women who are considered minority, the people living with disability, and we're also looking at the marginalized groups. For example, people who are in areas that uh, are not okay, also taken into consideration. And that also informs the preference and reservation scheme, uh, which must be observed by government officials. Then the other principle is the principle of integrity. All procurement practitioner, whether private or public sector, should act in a professional manner at all times. So you need to act as a professional. That is why this course is a professional course. Once you finish this course, you'll be able to understand what you're supposed to do in the profession. They should carry out their duties in accordance with the procurement laws, regulations, and policy. And when you are talking about procurement laws, we are talking about the Public Procurement Asset Disposal Act 2015. We are talking about the Public Procurement Regulation of 2020. And also we are talking about the Public-Private Partnership Act of 2009. The policy here, we are talking about the Public Procurement Policy, which is also very, very important. Then the issues of practice of fraud, bribery, and corruptions are not tolerated. And that is why in the event the government feels that one party is corrupt, they will always give you what is called compulsory leave and investigations will commence for certain whether what they are saying is true or not true. In the event you, you are guilty, then you have to be charged in a court of law and you can also be jailed depending on the issues or depending on what you did. Then you have the principle of public finance and chapter 12 of the constitution talks about public finance. It is very important to ensure at the end of the day, we do not have waste in public resources. And that is why when the government wants to raise taxes, you find that the citizens are not happy because the government cannot account for the taxes that we've been paying for those, these years. Therefore, people are very angry. And because of that, we have the burden of taxation and they still want to add more and more. So let's look at what the finance bill will bring to ensure that we follow that principle of public finance. The expectation is that suppliers will be developed and grown and conse consequently, the citizens will see the benefits. So public finance is using public funds well so that at the end of the day, you will be accountable for the money that was given to you through the taxes that you pay. And the expenditure must go hand in hand with what was collected 
in terms of revenue. So when they are trying to balance, they need to balance the revenue that was collected vis-a-vis -vis the expenditure. And also, if there is an amount that was not utilized, we need to know how much was not utilized. Then the other thing is the value of and principle of public service. As public servants, we need to have some values and principles. So the public procurement is guided by the values and principles of public service, which requires a high standard of professional ethics. And here we are looking at efficient, effective, and economic use of resources. And when you're talking about resources, we can look at resources in three ways, where we have the financial resources, we have the physical resources, and the last one is the human resource. Very important to look at how you use such resources to maximize your potential and your productivity. Then the other issue is issues of impartial and equitable provision of services. So you, know, you need not to be biased when you are produced, you are giving service to the citizens. Treat everybody with equal measure, regardless of their affiliations or regardless of their tribes or where they come from. Then we are talking about involvement of people in the process of policy making. So you need to engage people when you are doing some policies so that these policies will be favorable to all and it will create a win-win environment for both the institutions and the citizens or the public at large. Then the issue of transparency and provision to public of timely and accurate information. So here we are talking about timely and accurate information. So you need to provide the information whenever it, the information is required so that we see the issues of transparency. Then the other principle is the promotion of local industry, sustainable development and protection of the environment. Remember the government has come up with various initiatives for purposes of promoting local industries. And that is why they say build Kenya, make Kenya build Kenya by encouraging citizens to buy locally. For example, EPZ produces locally and we are encouraged to buy clothes from EPZ. And one of the reasons is to promote the local industry. And the issue of sustainable development, here we are looking at the environment. As much as you want to produce, you need to produce products that will not harm the health of the citizens of that country. Failure to do that, then it means once they realize you are not sustainable, you might end up closing your company because of the protection of the environment. And that is why nowadays you find the government is advocating for planting trees because they realize that we have a climatic change. And if you are not careful for the next maybe 50 years, you might have a bigger challenge than what is here currently. And the government last year was encouraging citizens to plant at least two to three trees for that purpose. So here, when you're talking about protection of environment, you need to engage all the stakeholders so that at the end of the day, everybody must participate in ensuring that they protect the environment. The other principle is a principle governing procurement professions and international norms. 
And when you look at the principle protecting government, the government established the Kenya Institute of Management and other societies for purposes of professionalism in procurement. And the government also is advocating for ensuring that they come up with a framework that will help to monitor the procurement procedures. And that is why we have various bodies that have been given that mandate. And that is why you must be a registered member of a certain body if you are a professional and who wants to practice public procurement. Then the other principle is maximization of value for money. Maximization of value for money. This means achievement of most advantageous combination of cost and at the same time looking at quality and sustainability to meet customer requirement. So as much as you want to buy, you must ensure that you buy items that will give you value for what you are buying. These items also need to give you quality. And quality here we are saying is items are supposed to meet their purpose or fitness for purpose or sometimes conformance to requirement. And when you look at the issue of cost, we are looking at the cost in terms of the whole life cost of an item. From the time you buy that item up to the time that item will be disposed or sold or destroyed, depending on the life cycle of that item. Then um, procurement transactions are made and commitments are made within reasonable time frame. Reasonable time frame. So, any question? Any question? No. So what is the role of public procurement on social economic development? What is the role of public procurement in social economic development? When you talk about social economic development, we are looking at development in two spectrums, the social aspect and the economic aspect. So when you are talking about public procurement, you need to look at the social aspect. How will public procurement impact the social, the social aspect of our day-to-day -day life? And how also will public procurement impact the economic development of a country? Remember, when citizens are comfortable, then it means citizens will have money to spend, and this will also lead to economic development. So one of the roles of public procurement is ensuring that we get best value for money in terms of acquiring quality goods, works and, and services in the whole life cost and also be able to meet the public need. The second role is developing of local capacity and employment. So one of the focus of public procurement is to have local capacity and local capacity here we are looking at opportunities that will be created both locally so that suppliers will have the capacity to supply even for, for government and once that capacity is built over time then people will be able to get employment and the rate of unemployment will also be reduced by a certain percentage then the other role of government is to promote innovation. And that is why the government has come up with various initiatives. For example, look at the Ministry of ICT. There was a time they came up with an initiative of empowering the youth so that youths no longer look for jobs manually, but they are able to work online, maybe through various initiatives. And at the end of the day, 
they create job opportunities. The government also was able to create things like the Huduma Centers, where you just walk in and you will be able to get a service at a go because all the government institutions were centralized on one particular space so that when you want maybe to get a KRA pin, you can get it. At the same time, you can get help, you can get other government services at a go and other initiatives. And these initiatives or innovations are geared towards ensuring that you come up with superior products and services that will, at the end of the day, create more and more opportunities for others. Then uh, the role, the other role of public procurement is role modeling in ethical practices. And here we are looking at different professional bodies which have their own code of conduct or code of operations. And these are what shapes the, the practices and it enhances the various professional bodies that are in Kenya. Then the other thing is the issue of ensuring sustainability by introducing the, the Rs where we have the reuse, we have the recycle, remanufacture, and other, other initiatives for purposes of creating what is called a circular kind of economy where you can recycle what you have. 